Well, good morning to you all. Hope you're all well and uh, welcome to the AFI Group webinar on the revised BS8460 Code of Practice on the Safe Use of MUPS. Um, really big thanks for you uh, joining me today. I know the weather's um, quite challenging in some areas of the UK. Um, it certainly hasn't hit us here yet in, um, in Castle Donington, but uh, nonetheless, you know, really, really uh, big thanks for attending. Hopefully you can all hear me okay. Um, and hopefully the weather's not going to play any sort of uh, gremlins on what we're doing today um, but hopefully that's all okay some familiar names joining me today even not only from the UK but from abroad um, so thanks very much for those of you um, that have joined us today for the first time my name is Brian Parker and I'm a business development manager um, technical support for the AFI group of companies the webinar is scheduled to last around 50 minutes um, and what we'll end up doing is a little short Q&A session at the end now, if you have any questions, please feel free to, join, uh, to ask them during the webinar. You'll see down on the right hand side, you've got the opportunity to put some questions in there. Um, you know, feel free to do that. I will do my best to answer all the questions during the webinar at the end. But for those that I'm not able to do so, I will do at the end of the webinar, possibly personally to you um, and, and share them. Um, the webinar is recorded. Um, so for those of the colleagues that you know, are not able to make it today, um, they can then look at the recording a little bit later on. So let's get started here. So we're talking today about the, the new BS8460 code of practice. Um, it's the safe use of MUPS. Um, and um, you know, those of you that have seen this recently, it was, re it was uh, released at the end of October. Um, and essentially, um, you know, for me personally, one of the best pieces of information uh, an informative document out there um, for the use of for the safe use of MUPS. A little bit about myself, um, as you can see, um, hopefully you're seeing my screen okay. My uh, accomplice is saying that you can't see my screen, which for some reason um, seems a bit bizarre. So, okay, so a little bit about myself. Um, um, I am um, a, a, a member of the IPAF UK Country Council um, and the Training Committee. I've been a previous um, Training Committee Chairman and also I was on the working group for the BS8460 Code of Practice. I'm the, chair, the vice chairman of the PASMA Training Committee, and um, um, for my sins, um, X Forces Royal Engineer, um, and I was a plant operator. Hopefully you can see my screen. What what um, what the system we use is what's kind of apologies for that is go to webinar and they've changed their little um, icons in the top um, and unfortunately I think it was showing as a as a no screen. So that's my ugly mug there. Um, hopefully you can get some information about me um, and you can see there that I've got uh, sufficient um, you know, background on the subject. Okay, so just moving on. Um, conscious of time, what is a BS code of practice and what is its legal status? So essentially, you know, I'm not sure you know, but for those of you unsure, I must tell you that British standard is in itself not law. Any code of practice is there essentially to supplement and support the regulations that are out there. But before you switch off, you know, be mindful that there are many regulations which are pertinent to the safe working with MUPS. And as such, much guidance has been written by associations such as IPAF, the CPA, um, Strategic Forum Plant Safety Group. Now, sometimes you don't know where to start. And those for you who burn the midnight oil possibly don't know when to stop when you've reached the end of your research into you know any given subject. A highly just before you sort of uh, think about this code of practice, a highly respected member of the HSC was involved in the rewrite, so you can be sure that when looking at standards, you know, if God forbid there has been an incident, they will refer to the guidance that's uh, you know included in this. But essentially, what this code of practice does do is bring everything together. Um, and signpost you to further guidance that's out there in the industry. I, I will say that the code of practice does come with a high price tag. Um, £254 is, is what BSI charge for, for non-members. And if you're a member of BSI, 
it's uh, 127 pounds currently i know there are various organizations trying to make this more sort of affordable to you know to all you know to all uh, people but you know when you take into account you know what um you know fees for intervention cost these days that's you know you know it's not really a, a huge cost um what um, what I'm going to do now is just we'll go through the scope in a minute. But one thing I want to draw your attention to is that the Health and Safety at Work Act, lifting up uh, Lola, lifting operations and lifting equipment regulations, the Pure regulations, supply and machine regulations, the worker height regulations, and the CDM regulations are all used and referenced in this in this um, code of practice. So what I'm going to do now is just launch a little poll, and if you can just um, um, you know. Uh, put you put what your thoughts are on there um, so essentially um, who here has purchased um, the new BS8460 couple of seconds you know it, it, you might think it is a lot of money and I suppose in some respects it's you know we, we don't get that money as, a, as an organization you know I work for AFI group you know we put that time aside freely but um, you know the, the standards out there um, and those that you know choose to uh, you know to use that is, is gonna you know hopefully be in a better place should the regulator come knocking okay so I can see that, that you know just just under 90 percent of you um, have got the uh, you know purchased the the um, Sorry, wrong. I'm looking at the screen. They've changed it again. 12% of you have, put, have purchased it and 90% of you have not. Well, hopefully by the end of today, um, with a bit of luck, I might be able to change your perception on, on what the, what this is. And, and more importantly, you know, how, how useful it is for you. OK. Um, so I'll close that one off. Thank you. Um, so just out of curiosity then, um, and just to get a little bit of a, a thought, um, how many of you had the previous code of practice? Um, if you can give me an indication there, and then that will give me some idea as to you know what you know what what you were used to in the past um, you know code of practice, and, and more importantly now what's changed uh, in in this one. So only 79% of you have voted. So that means 30% of you are probably still asleep. Okay, so the old code of practice was was um, was first distributed in 2005. Um, I think at the time when it came out, I think it was quite you know. You know, this is the first time we've ever had anything that kind of steered me in the right direction for managing, you know, the safe use of MOOPs. So at the time, it was quite important. OK, I'll close that off on there. All right. So 32% uh, of you had the old code of practice, whereas 68% um, of you um, didn't have the code of practice. So interesting. OK, so. I'm going to say this now. Some of you may think by the end of this webinar that I'm on commission from BSI. I can 100% confirm that I am not. Um, but you know, in order to have a look at any change of any original document necessary um, to build a business case to BSI on why we think that the review was necessary. Therefore, the 2005 standard was sent out for review um, and it went out to industry. And thankfully, um, you know, at the time I was I was very you know pro we need a review, but hundreds of comments were received. Um, naturally, BSI um, agreed to form the working groups um, and I was involved in the working group for some 18 months with some other industry uh, experts on the subjects. Um, now, certainly one of the factors uh, that drove the review was the large amount of changes in legislation, guidance, you know, MOOC design, innovations that have come out in the industry, which have happened since the original document was released back in 2005. And we'll take a little bit of a, a quick journey through some of that now. So we've had design changes. You know, we've seen the standards change Quite, off, quite often, you know, the machinery directive, regulations, amendments, okay, um, and they've changed, you know, through through the years. We've had EN280 um, change, and we can see there that um, the machine design and stability calculations and criteria have changed three times. Firstly, in 2009, then in 2013. And lastly, in 2015. So certainly, with with this information, there was certainly a need for um, 
you know, looking at the standard to bring all, all this up to date. Legislation, um, I'm sure I don't need to tell a lot of you in here, you know, some of the legislation that's changed, but if we consider some of the aspects of the work at height regulations, the guidance was, was more, the first set of guidance was, was uh, released in 2005, and yet we had the uh, work at height regulations come out in April 2005. So essentially, the, you know, the, the, the horse had bolted and, and, and uh, you know, there was information out there that we needed to make sure that we captured. The CDM regulations have been updated twice first in 2007 and then in, and then more recently in 2015 but then if we look at some of the guidance that's been out there for MUPS we had MSI uh, MSI uh, S614 in 2006 CIS58 in 2008 and then you know lately GEIS6 in 2014 so you know again new guidance that's come out industry's changing MOOPs are changing so we needed to be mindful that some of these things needed to be you know re reflected in the in the guidance document and then of course in the standard and then lastly we have guidance we've been, which has been prepared by safety forums such as the strategic forum plant safety group we've had medical fitness to operate plant we've had ground conditions um, for construction plants very big documents you know some 76 pages on um, you know on uh, on actually just ground conditions but all plant We've got competence to operate plant. Um, and then we've had um, from the CPA little sort of working groups that have been put aside, you know, that have you know tackled subjects which you know are certainly uh, important to our industry. So avoiding trapping and crushing injuries in the platform, guidance on secondary guarding devices, you know, a, a mute safety alert pr protocol, and certainly you know the inspection, maintenance, and through examination documents, so managing the safe use of mobile elevated working platforms. So as you can see, there was quite a, quite a bit of information there. So in the new guidance then, there's been a number of new definitions and I've included a couple here just so you get a flavor of how the standard gives you informative information and more importantly defines what you and your organization's responsibilities are. Some of you will be familiar with the term secondary guarding. Some may still uh, hear or use the term anti-entrapment. For clarity, anti-entrapment is a term which is no longer used. Um, so whilst reviewing the document and looking at all the definitions, we were kind of mindful that, you know, we were talking about the secondary garden, but we were mindful that primary garden act had, hadn't actually been defined. So those of you that were using MUPS um, will understand that before you were able to operate any function control, you either have to um, place your foot on a foot switch, hold a trigger or push a button. Now, this is essentially what's known as primary garden. But I'll also emphasize that this is primary guarding of the controls. So it's protecting the controls from being operated. OK, so you can see the foot switch there. You can see the, you know, the enable button. And of course, the, there's triggers out there. So we've now defined what essentially is primary guarding. The user, um, often the user was often felt to be the person who was actually using the MUP, um, and that's far from far from correct. So the user has now been defined as a person or organization that has control of the planning, the management and the use of that MUP. Um, and they're responsible for ensuring that the MUP is kept in a surf working condition. So if we take into account this, it could include a person responsible for the site. It could be a principal contractor. It could be a subcontractor. Uh, subcontractor. Um, it could also be the operator. Um, so, you know, in some, in some occasions that might be, you know, justified. Um, so user is very important and I'll refer a little bit more to user within the webinar. Deck riding, um, the practice of placing a, a mupe on a previously erected structure above the ground um, prior to a structural completing. You can see the, you can see the machine that's going up there on, on, the, on what we call a sled or what has been known as a sled in the past. Um, and it's fixed, you know, there's various sort of things that have been sort of, um, you know, ensured that the thing can't move on this particular occasion. You know, the wheels have been re removed on that particular one, but that's not always the case. Um, but this is a temporary mute support frame, which then can be lifted up, um, you know, as the building, uh, as the building, uh, you know, lifts up as well as, as the building is erected. So a little bit about um, uh, hazards and in the, in the in the document, I think, you know, this is probably going to be um, very useful for those of you who undertake or review risk assessments which are relevant to MUPS. Taking ta tasks such as transport, delivery, collection, of which most hirers or users think it's not their responsibility, but it often is. Um, it would be really useful and make you think about, you know, what loading and unloading arrangements there are, what's the ground conditions, you know, setting up and positioning, using and maintaining, you know, maintenance of MUPS. And it can be varied due to the different types and categories of MUPS that you may have on your site or, or, or even within your premises. 
But let's be honest, how many how many of you have sat down and started to prepare or even to review a, mis a MUP risk assessment and you've found yourself banging your head against the wall thinking, have I thought of all the hazards, you know, risks which are significant to the use of MUPs? This section, I think, will help you immensely when you're considering the tasks from delivery to collection, the hazards from use, you know, setting up the machine, you know, the actual use, you know, how the operator works. But the great thing about this document is it also includes the relevant clauses and sub clauses, which then you can reference and you can see them on the right. So you can see there you've got the stage, the activity, the hazard, the cause and the reference. So even when it's hyperlinked, you will then be sent, you know, you'll be able to then go to the, you know, the relevant section in there. Now, what I've done here is highlighted outrigger, stabilizer, um, you know, interchangeable equipment and accessories and even folding and unfolding guardrails. And you can see it identifies that activity, the hazard, and then you would then look at the various causes. And then when you look into the sub clause, it will give you more you know, detailed commentary in there, helping you prepare essentially what you're doing for your job. Um, now there is a caveat, which I'll have to say that you know, this is the typical hazards associated with these activities. It's not an exhaustive list. Um, and you'd be mindful that you know, each and every situation should be assessed on its own merits. Um, but it does, you know, highlight, you know, the very many hazards that are caused by failure to typically follow the most important piece of information that we get with the machine, which is the manufacturer's instructions. A lot of this will have to be used with the manufacturer's instructions, too. Um, so just be, mind, be mindful of that. OK, um, load and loading. I've, I've been involved with IPATH now in some form or another for around about 20 years. And, you know, the industry has uh, changed incredibly in this time. Naturally, you expect more from your rental company and the MUPs that you hire these days. Um, some years ago, the IPAF UK Country Council took the decision to mandate accident reporting to all member companies. Um, and this was essentially to drive safety in the industry and you know, improve it. With the bulk of the incidents initially being reported by rental companies, um, these are now, you know, now seeing a bit of a, you know, an increase in the um, incidents that have been reported by contractors too. OK, so essentially, we know from the accident statistics that, um, you know, the delivery and the collection process is one of the most dangerous and where we find the most accidents occur, even with our own organization, you know, even down to slips, trips, falls, you know, banging heads, uh, you know, slips off the back of the truck. You know, they're, they're all things that we see in the industry. And with that in mind, the code of practice focuses on the load and unloading um, you know, operation, but it also signs you then, signposts you then to other IPAF guidance, which has been prepared by other groups. So essentially, there's no point reinventing the wheel if it's already there. It will direct you to the guidance that's out there, and then you can then you know put together you know the various um, you know sorts of things that you look at. If we take a typical picture of a load and loading, you know it's loaded loaded in the depot. You can see these guardrails on a lot of you know rental companies' uh, trucks now. It's loaded onto there chained and secured down, canopy secure, you know, and then it arrives on your site. That thing, you know, 40 foot long uh, trailer, how, where is it going to be positioned? How are you going to, um, you know, look at that? You know, have you got a loading and loading area? Is it safe? Is it your responsibility? Is it not your responsibility? All these things are answered within, within the standard. Um, it's great, this document, because it identifies you as your user responsibility. You know, take into account, you know, have you got a well-lit area? Is it sufficient size? Is the ground firm and level? Have you segregated it from other work activities? You know, traffic um, management is very important. Ensuring the traffic is not going to be caused, um, you know, going to cause any problems. But pedestrians and members of the public, are, you know, are not injured. And of course, we have to ensure that we are clear of overhead and uh, underground hazards. Um, when we're securing it, you know, ensuring that, you know, slew pins are potentially um, uh, engaged to prevent the, the boom accidentally slewing out. Extending decks are, are uh, um, locked to prevent sliding out, you know, and canopy doors, you know, a canopy door opening up on a, on a motorway, at, you know, 48, 50 mile an hour can be just like, you know, ripped off that machine that you can see there. And then suddenly, you know, that's uh, then hurtling behind, towards the car or, or whatever behind you. But then we also take things like, you know, on the public. Uh, on the highway sometimes it's unavoidable it does say in the document that, that we, we we really ought to be avoiding this um, but you know scheduling deliveries for quiet times avoiding peak traffic times identifying whether the delivery vehicle will park is he going to reverse in is he going to drive in what if the what if there is an incident you no know, have i got a runoff area um has the runoff area considered for getting something like the boom that you can see on your left 
um, off the back of the truck and then turn into your site. If he's coming off the back of the truck, like we see in the picture there, you might be then turning sharp left to get into your site. But in turn, then he's actually then potentially putting the basket and the platform and, of course, the operator uh, in, in the road, in the road or the vehicle sort of way. Uh, and, and, you know, we're passing traffic. Um, you know, and of course, sometimes you may have to have competent and authorised, you know, slinger signaller um, or banksman or banks person and even potentially vehicle and pedestrian management. Now, I've put a picture there um, of an Andy Access poster. These are out now for the industry. So, you know, if you go onto the IPATH website, these are freely downloadable. Um, and with that Andy Access um poster as you can see there just a snippet of a poster you will get a toolbox talk but there are many different types out there so again being aware of, the, of some of the situations so hopefully that can help you um, it was felt necessary that oscillating axles need a little bit more defining um, because th there are different types of oscillating axles um, and an oscillating axle essentially ensures that the wheels within the limits of oscillation are in contact with the ground but depending upon the configuration at the time of the upper structure will depend on what actually that platform or that boom or that machine will do. And in some situations, for example, um, you know, it will stop the machine from driving. Um, however, some of the older machines that are out there won't. So you may have an active uh, oscillating axle. And again, as you can see with that within the, you know, it will, it will um, allow the, the self-propelled move, uh, mute to move in a controlled manner to ensure that within the limits of that oscillation, all the wheels remain in contact with the ground but then when you've got the passive one all right that may then have a you know a little sort of different sort of way of looking at that um, and that will move freely during travel um, and again the idea is that to keep it all you know in in contact with the ground at all times but the massive difference in how they actually actually work you'll see with the new moops now you know those of you that have been in them um, you will see that you know should you get onto uneven ground the platform will just stop and you've got you know the, the it won't allow you to dry it will it will it will cut the dry function so you've got to return to ground level um a lot's been um you know put along with cell with familiarization and there's quite there's quite a big section in there on, on familiarization ipaf have produced a familiarization statement that's been you know it's done the round since 2007 so some 11 years now um and in turn that's in truth that's probably not changed much as such but when we look at um, the next sort of, you know, we're in, we're in an age now uh, where we've got to be mindful that there are other ways of, of being able to familiarise. Um, and, you know, self-familiarise has its own annex, um, Annex E, and it has additional commentary in that. Now, both familiarisation and self-familiarisation are defined. Um, and clearly, there are different ways in which familiarisation can be carried out, carried out. The traditional way would be having a trained uh, IPATH demonstrator carry out this. Or nowadays, you know, the way that modern technology is, we can self-familiarise. But there is, you know, there, there is um, things that you've got to be mindful of. Self-familiarisation um, should only be carried out by someone who's been authorised to do that. Are they a competent person to be able to self-familiarise? You know, have they, you know, has the user taken into account the hazards associated with the complexity and the capacity of the machine? You've got to take into account the previous experience of the op of the operator. If they've only just passed their course, they may be not in a, in a position to be able to self-familiarise. They may well be. Um, the operator has got to be given adequate time to carry out the process. We've got to think about having a safe position and a safe location for the, to do that. Um, the training course that they have um, been given allows them to uh, extract the information from the machine operator's manual. Um, and of course, the operator themselves, they're confident in their ability to self-familiarise. Um, have all the relevant information being made available through examination, the operator's manual, um, and then of course, how we're we going to log this. You know, uh, every if I if I take the IPAF uh, uh, operators course, you know, everybody is issued a, a logbook at the end of their um, you know their training course. I've probably count on my hand the amount of times I've got to site and somebody's got that logbook. Often it's left in the van, it's at home, um, or they've just binned it. So, you know, in that sense, you know, how are we going to record, you know, the fact that they've been given a familiarization? We've took as a, as a business a different approach and some of these will see, you know, that we now offer a familiarization film, uh, films with a QR code. And, you know, we're up to nearly 40,000 people that have, have viewed these films now and they're freely available to you um you know model specific um that are within our fleet so you know it, we're not the only ones doing that 
you know we'll see rental company other rental companies and of course manufacturers at some time and then personally i think you'll see you know other industries take that sort of initiative you know for things like you know excavators telehandlers and such but familiarization you know it's important it is your responsibility as as, as if you're if you're the manager supervisor uh, or, or as, as we often say as the user um so just be mindful about this okay uh modifications um the working group felt it was important to ensure that modifications and you know fitting of additional devices or equipment was included within the standard um, many times we find MUP operators operated with uh, you know pipes or, or uh, cladding balanced on the guardrails uh, and I've seen it many times it is explicit in the standard the guardrails of the MUP should not be used to carry the materials so I can t see that um, boom um, there in in the um, in the in the picture. So I'm working away. I've got the drive controller, and I've got them them pieces of you know materials behind me. I'll be holding on to them with my other hand, or an operator, you know, a colleague would be holding on to them. You know, the ground that I'm going to be travelling on is going to be all over the you know bouncing and moving because it's a rough train machine. The mindfulness of that that is that you know we should have something that's secured to ensure that that machine will you know that the, the materials will not move. Um, so before you then go and think about you know what's the material handling devices we've got what's the range additional equipment or, or accessories should only be fitted or, or changed on a mupe in accordance with the mupe or accessory manufacturer's instructions before the mupe is used it should be checked to determine whether the fitting has been carried out correctly so make sure that's on correctly it's positively attached but there is a big caveat in the um in the in the document uh, and it does and in, in the standard it does come essentially from the best practice guidance for mupes on avoiding and trapping crushing injuries to people in the platform um, in section six and it does say the original mute manufacturer is not liable for the adaption addition or modification or any effects it has on the safety and performance of the mupe the person carrying out the adaption so uh, addition or modification takes on the responsibilities and may become liable for the safety of the complete mupe so essentially what that's saying is I'm not going to bother hiring that cladding stand. I'm not going to bother, you know, um, hiring that pipe rack. Instead, I'll, I'll fab something up myself. And we've seen it before where guardrails have been drilled and, you know, and some type of, um, you know, holding devices being drilled into the platforms and we'll, uh, we'll use that instead. Um, basically, it says there, if you attach a homemade um, attachment or something has not not been approved by the manufacturer you may carry the full liability and it will also come that you know we've got to make sure that what you know we will as a, as a company we've took the stance that we will only supply you with attachments that are approved from the manufacturer that way then okay there's no issues at all in terms of you know marking and ce marking and it's just something that you know i feel needs to be be mentioned attach things that are unimproved at your at your risk and at your own peril Okay, um, we mentioned earlier a little bit about uh, secondary guarding, um, and I, you know, any any of you that have interested have done a previous webinar on secondary guarding, and you'll see that in some of the archives that we've got on our website. Um, but the guidance does state that you know whether further measures are needed to implement it to reduce any remaining risk of entrapment, um, we then have to or if you fitted or selected or fitted an additional secondary guarding device. Um, then we need to ensure that what we fitted, we fitted for the right reasons. So, you know, which say, you know, which secondary guarding device have you selected? There's many out there. Um, there's many different types. Some of them do different actions. How does it work? What, you know, what does the actual secondary guarding do when it's actually activated? For example, does it stop the machine completely? Sound an alarm, beacon, flash, you know, tell tell somebody, or does it reverse the last function? Or does it you know just basically stop the machine and there's many different types out there also be mindful as well that it may interfere with the rescue of that the mupe okay so you've tripped off the uh, if you've tripped the secondary guarding device there may be some reasoning as to what that then does to the base controls uh, of the machine the guidance reminds you that there is no one particular device um, or item equipment that will prevent entrapment in all known circumstances but if the secondary guarding device has been fitted all right, the operator and any nominated um, ground emergency rescue persons should be familiar with the operation and the additional secondary guarding device, how it functions, how it operates, how it's triggered, how, how can I reset it? But once fitted, again, we should then also ensure that we uh, make sure that the, the uh, secondary guarding device is included in any pre-use inspection regime. 
Um, and then of course, when selecting a device or equipment to address a single hazard, potentially a specific hazard, consideration should be given to the potential for significantly, significantly increasing the possible risk of other hazards. Now, many different types out there. I'm not going to list them all. You know, some are bars, some are um, so some are fixed bars, some are movable bars, some bars um, you know break away if the force is too much, and there are some that are you know essentially what we call um, structural bars that you know take take the the um, you know the impact before the operator takes the impact. Now, one thing I will always say is there is no magic pill. Um, how many of you have actually reversed into something in your car? even with your reversing sensors fitted. You know, we think that they were gonna have these devices fitted to the machines and they're gonna, you know, that's gonna basically show everything. It's gonna protect all your operators from being hurt, crushed, injured, killed, or worse. Um, we've had a couple of incidents in the UK recently. Uh, one of them was on the uh, publicized on the vertical um, website the other day, you may have seen. Um, of course, I don't know the full um, ins and outs of that and it's ongoing, but you know, uh, looking at the picture, what I'm trying to say is I fit a secondary guarding device and I don't need to worry. I can just reverse back and it'll stop. We've still got, you know, the, the operator's part to play. You've still got the manager and the user's part to play. I know myself, I've reversed into something with my car, with my car sensors. Uh, I've changed that car now. But, you know, because you get distracted, things happen. So, you know, it's one of them things where you just have to be mindful. So, um Rescuing from height. Um, so we've taken the secondary guarding aspect. Okay, God forbid something goes wrong. What if we've got to get that person down? And this is where the standard does really help you because again, it's got an annex in there uh, for, for giving you some sort of hierarchical side of things, but it also then covers you all the elements that we need to look at when rescuing from height. So the rescue of any occupants in the, in the machine um, it, you know, such as a mal machine malfunction or platform entanglement or illness should always be part of any safe system of work. Too many times when I've challenged people in the past, they've known how to, you know, they've, they've known about emergency rescue, but they've little idea how to actually affect that rescue. Um, often referring to using emergency controls, climbing, in, you know, climbing out of machines into another, you know, into another machine. It's all about planning. I've got to put your four pictures up there. Um, I, I could I could train you on the the, the number three scissor lift um, electric scissor and you can use the the big diesel scissor on your left hand side same category completely different emergency lowering okay we've got a stick boom second picture and I've got an articulated boom on on the fourth picture all different things all right so in terms of how they use how they're operated different manufacturers different types of emergency lowering position of emergency lowering okay it's a cliche to say it but you know but fail to plan, be prepared to fail. And that's, you know, that's the mantra that you've got to look at. If I haven't got a plan in place, how, the, how am I going to get that person down? So the user should ensure that, and it does say it, the user should ensure there's a suitable emergency rescue plan developed and the information is disseminated to the operators and emergency teams. The plan takes into account the arrangements for rescue, um, takes into account, you know, ground controls, emergency auxiliary lowering controls, and even a basket to basket rescue system. Um, it does talk and, and specifically tells you that the use of controls and rescue procedures should be practiced by operators and rescue persons. Um, rescue, as we all know as well, may be necessary in the event of illness, injury, or risk of potential exposure. Look at the weather today. So, you know, I'm sure people are out today are, are, feeling, are feeling the chill. But any rescue procedure should be properly planned, take into account uh, the reasons why the platform is stranded at height, and, you know, the, the reasons and need for any urgent action. Um, so whenever possible, rescue should be carried out by appropriately trained and or familiarized persons using the machine's ground controls and then the emergency auxiliary power pack or manual bleed down systems. I mentioned earlier about the Annex G. Um, so there's a, an example of a rescue plan hierarchy. It's great information, um, uh, you know, essentially giving you a, you know, certainly a, an example. I'm not going to say it's the, the be all and end all. You may find that some machines, you know, slightly different how they work, but essentially it's the same. We always use the upper primary con controls. That's, of course, if the operator is capable of doing that. Um, if they can't use the primary controls for some reason, then they will use the auxiliary controls. 
Now, not all um, platforms, uh, certainly uh, not all of them, have upper auxiliary controls. There are some machines out there that do not have upper auxiliary controls. We're then reliant upon somebody on the ground who we're going to then, all being well, use the ground primary controls. So again, making sure the ground primary controls are accessible, not up against the wall where I can't get to them, not in a canopy next to a you know a pack of bricks where I can't open the open the canopy to, because the bricks are there. Do you see what I'm getting at? Okay. Um, we'll also then maybe I have to refer to the ground auxiliary controls, and then under um, in the in the annex it then talks about mid air rescue. You know, so you know if I have to get somebody down, how am I going to get that person down? You know, having another machine on site exactly the same size is not always possible. Sometimes I can't get two machines to the same place. I do know one site where they, you know, they've taken safety to, you know, very, very, you know, very importantly. And in, in one of the jobs I was on recently, where they actually had a standby machine of 135 foot boom specifically to rescue people should, you know, the, uh, you know, items one to four not work. So, you know, you have to applaud sometimes um, some of the information there. Okay, I'm going to give you a bit. Just going to show, show you a little film uh, in a second, um, but I'm going to give you a bit of background. Now, um, the following mute rescue video has been willingly shared by both the contractor and the principal contractor to highlight the importance of practicing emergency rescue. Um, now, this principal contractor, um, for their safe system of work for mutes, include a trained uh, mute manager on all sites. All subcontractors that use mutes also have to have an IPAF trained mute manager available to them to the team. Um, IPATH PAL plus trained operators for all steel erection, safety netters and all operators who operate machines over 66 foot. Uh, there is a mute pre-delivery uh, movement order which is specific and that's got to be provided before arrival on site um, and it specifies the mute spec and the key personnel who's going to be involved with it. All mute operators must view the specific mute familiarization an emergency descent AFI film from ourselves before they commence work, and the name and mobile numbers displayed on the MUP of all emergency descent trained rescuers. Now, so the site manager has done this, the company's obviously put this procedure in place. They've complied with all the company protocols. There's one, lift, one, left thing, uh, one thing left for them to do, which is not to sit in the office with their fingers crossed, but essentially to practice what they preach. Therefore, in 2017, the project. Now, this is the this is a sneaky bit. So you might some of you might know this. I actually know the the, uh, the mute manager on this site um, and um, and the and the safety manager. So you know, hopefully, I'm not going to embarrass anybody in, on this one. But in 2017, the project manager and the project mute manager agreed with the subcontractor, site manager, and the mute operator that at a certain time he would collapse against the second degrading device on the mute and essentially, in inverted commas, play dead. OK, this was filmed from a mobile phone. And what you're going to need now see is that footage. The video shows the rescue in process. So make a note visually, verbally, whatever, on what you see. OK. OK, so now you can hear the secondary garden alive alert sounded. And then it'll go louder. You can see the light flashing. At the back of the boom can you see the operator behind disappear so he's looked and thought I'm out of here you see the light flashing a couple of minutes long this film so bear with me you'll see something shortly so you can see the colleague in the mute behind has ignored the situation and the alarm and moves their platform away it's a busy site, you've got cranes working, you've got other plant working. <clears throat> now you've just seen his black hat site safety supervisor arrive and shout up, doesn't get a response from the operator and then goes back to work. Hopefully there's no profanities being shouted here that you'll hear. So 
So now he's finally reacted and he's going to bring the mute down as per his emergency lowering familiarization um, requires him to. He's now trying to work out how to lower the machine down. Do I have the key in base? Do I have the key in platform? Do I use auxiliary? Do I use power? You can hear the lowering beeper working. And you can probably just hear the auxiliary work there like a motor working. And there she starts to descend. So he's now realised he needs to rotate the boom away, um, the chassis away, so he can um, rotate the turret to get it into a position where they can lower. If you watch closely the operator in the platform, um, albeit, albeit it's a very, very serious video, this, it did, it did make me chuckle, as you'll see shortly. So he just woke up to have a look. He's obviously had a good look and um, and had a look a look around. He's still in inverted commas playing dead. Okay, so I can only presume they cut the sound at some point there because there was probably was some profanities being shouted. But um, he gets down to ground, which is the good thing, and he lives to fight another day. But, you know, let's look at the blackout supervisor. At no time did he summon first aid assistance. Did he call for an ambulance? I know the, the, the uh, principal contractor did have people at the phone just in case um, to sort of say, yes, we're, we're taking, we're making that call now. You know, just there's no need to do that. But, you know, before you sort of chastise this, um, this, this company, and I won't mention the company, we need to applaud, applaud this project team for practice the, for, you know, practicing it. We don't need to think that this is poor. This is, this is really, really great stuff that we're seeing there. How often, think about it, how often do we test fire alarms? Do we run a mock tower crane and confined space rescue? And yet, shouldn't we regularly test our Mupimern descent policy for different machines? That particular machine, that Genie Z6034, is relatively simple, quite simple to operate. The guy, you know, he might have six or seven different types of booms on site that all operate essentially differently. So again, you need to be mindful that there are different machines out there and, 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 the, proce and the procedures. Just going to run a little poll there. You know, some of you will some of you'll be watching that. But, you know, after seeing that emergency rescue um, drill, how many now of you would, uh, would actually then think that you need to include this um, type of uh, rescue drill within your, um, you know, within your, um, your policies and your procedures? I could have picked a little small scissor lift there. I could have picked a little push around type machine. I could have had a truck mount or a track on site. Only 74% of you have voted, so if you can just make sure that you know, we have a little bit more participation there. So would you include this type of, uh, of drill in your procedures or, or would you not? Give you another 20 seconds. <laughs> 10 seconds. Be interested in those of you who are, who are saying no, you know, after this or you know let me know why you wouldn't include this is there a reasoning behind it um i'll tell you now overwhelmingly um the answer is yes 96 percent of the people um out of the 83 percent who are on this webinar have voted yes um and there's over 100 people on the webinar um <clears throat> so um great i think the video is really great and i applaud the company for doing it um i think at the end of the day i would imagine there would have been some choice words between the supervisor and the mupe operator and, and probably vice versa after that but um you know uh, you know without a doubt most people have thought that that's really sort of uh, you know good to see which is good
Okay, um, moving on then. Um, for some 20 years now, probably more, we've mentioned the minimum safe distance of working with overhead uh, electric lines. Uh, things have changed somewhat, um, and I, for one, certainly was very nervous uh, when we started discussing this because in the UK we have a you know pretty good record in working overhead, uh, working close to overhead power lines. But you know we now need to see what the standard says. So we've always had this ruling of nine meters. Um, plus the full length of your machine from from wooden poles, or 15 meters from plus the full length of your machine from you know pylons, steel pylons. Um, what essentially now the guidance has, says now is we work now with what's called a general exclusion zone, and it says that the general exclusion zone, the user should manage the risks and ensure that a general exclusion zone of 15 meters from steel towers and nine meters from wooden poles is maintained where possible. So that's the same of what we've already had. All right. But then what it then talks about is the absolute minimum exclusion zones. So when working within the general exclusion zone distance cannot be avoided, a robust site specific assessment of the risk justifying the decision to work within this exclusion zone should then be made. Um, and of course, any other sort of you know additional precautions um, have identified and implemented accordingly. It also talks about standard standoff distances so a safe standoff distance should also be established to ensure the mute cannot accidentally enter the exclusion zone. Um, and then it says then before you start working safely inside that general exclusion zone, you know, reasonable text, uh, reasonable steps should be taken by the user to arrange for services to be isolated for the period of work. Isolation should be confirmed in writing by the owner of the line prior to commencing. There's going to be person in control of the works. It's quite a large section. I probably can't do it justice on this webinar, um, but you can see there on some of the distances from some of these cables. You know, in the past we've talked about 15 meters for, for pylons, and yet since you know straight away we're talking there seven and six meters, depending on the voltage um, that's um, you know used on them cables. Likewise for the um, the wooden poles, we're now talking about three meters, and in, and in some cases one meters. Um, so just be mindful. You know, there's some great guidance out there avoiding danger the look out look up side of things so just be just be mindful of uh, of these sort of things okay we also had uh, last year the strategic forum plant safety group released their guidance document inspection maintenance and through examination the doc's aim was to ensure that duty holders understood their relevant legal duties um, and explains essentially explains the safe working condition of a mute from cradle to grain grave. Um, many users still don't understand their legal responsibilities under this guidance. And again, the HSA were involved with that uh, guidance document. So, you know, within within the um, the standard, it taught and it gives you an idea of what is pre-delivery inspection before you accept delivery of a hired MUP, you know, what you should ensure that's been carried out. What, re what responsibilities you've got for pre-use checks. Don't forget ensuring that we do, you know, have secondary guarding included in the pre-use checks. Refueling of power units, you know, and charging of batteries. And then the, the, you know, the different types of inspection and examinations there are and the responsibilities. And of course, the people that are doing them inspections, what would you expect the competency of that person uh, to be that carries out them inspections? But essentially what we're trying to do is create this safe working condition of this machine and it's very important that people understand understand that naturally with um, any standard you would expect to uh, have training and competence I've mentioned a little bit on the examination side and the in inspection and what we'd expect that person um, but you know not only operators but other trades associated the driver the PDI inspector you know the the, the mute manager you know the, the 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 persons who are you know the user who's, what trainer they had so employers should evaluate evaluate the existing competence of each employee that carry out tasks allotted to them and train each employee to ensure that they make any shortfall up between the competence and, and what is required. So it gives you a list of, of, of ex, uh, expectations on what you would expect that that person's core element uh, is capable of doing when working in and around MUPS. Um, and training, you know, as you would expect, it's got to encompass core elements and it gives, and it's quite a long, a long section table too. Um, and you'll see a small part of it here, but generally it's just provided for following tasks, talking about planning, management and supervision operating the MUP and rescue, you know, how to demonstrate various aspects, maintenance, you know, test and examination of it. Uh, and also, you know, you can carry out a site assessment. So if I come to your site to, to tell you which MUP to use, you know, what, ex you know, what sort of, um, you know, what training would you expect me to have had to, to be able to deliver, you know, a site survey for you. Um, 
obviously the guidance is, is quite long, but um, what I would also say is it covers other elements, you know, things like non-ionizing radiation. We're seeing more and more now of these, um, you know, these, um, you know, um, radar um, antennas, um, you know, in some other countries, you're obviously getting things uh, dis uh, disguised as, as, as trees. Um, so, you know, some of the risks there and, and what we should do in and around that. Um, guidance on competent persons. So certainly the mute rescue person and any supervisors. Pedestrian control of mutes. You can see this bottom picture on the, on, the right, on the right there. That was actually taken off one of our toolbox talks that we delivered to our own staff about the, dis, uh, the, the, the risks and the dangers of, of, of wonder leading or pedestrian controlling, dog walking, a, a small scissor following industry incidents where people have ran themselves over. But you often see this, you know, on sites where people are, you know, walking them down corridors. Sometimes they need to do that because they've, you know, got to collapse the guardrails to get it through and under doorways or low heights. But again, the risks of that. Uh, mupes on other structures. You've seen the um, mupe on a sled, um, on a steel sled. But what if it's on a water, you know, waterborne craft or, you know, and other things like that. So again, it covers covers that anchoring of the machine and such. Um, and then the much talked, um, you know, access control, locking out the machines, machines so only certain people can use it, ensuring that only authorised people can use that machine for the period of use. Telematics, you know, how much use is the actual MUPE getting? Um, is it actually being effective? So, you know, there's there's loads more information that the uh, the, the BS8460 um, does cover. Um, so just to summarise then, um, Obviously, there we've got um, we've gone through the sum scope of the document, um, some of the changes that we've uh, identified, some key definitions which I think you need to be mindful of, um, and um, you know load and loading responsibilities. It's quite a big section. We as an organisation, AFI Group, we see most of our incidents happening with truck drivers, um, and we're not alone in this. Um, we know that from the stat uh, stats that uh, are submitted to IPAF. Incidentally, anybody who reports any accidents or incidents to IPAF, we as members, uh, members of the council, do not see um, any of them. Um, it, they're completely, um, you know, um, anonymous. Uh, all we get to see is the incident and the and the you know what what actually happened. So we can then sort of look at how we can improve training courses, um, tra you know, and training and, and, and machines, of course. Self familiarisation. Um, so you know, how are you going to cover that? Um, and, and what's your responsibilities, modifications, um, and how you would ensure that you know the fitting of any additional devices is done um, properly. Um, secondary guarding, um, again, making sure you've got the right types of equipment on there. What, what, how does it work? What effect does it have on the machine? How does it affect the rescue? When we're looking at rescue, I think we've seen a great film today um, that just gives it, you know, okay, there is a, there is a very, very serious side of the, to, that, to that. And if we think back to that film. The, the only boom that was elevated on that boom was the primary boom up in the air. Um, what if it had his lower boom elevated, rotated through the steel work? You know, you'd be hearing the noise, but wouldn't be actually seeing the person because he might be in the shadow or anything like that. Um, so again, just be mindful that the people on the ground may need to know, you know, what they're doing, you know, very, very much more than what they're doing. We've seen a massive change in the overhead power lines and this, you know, working in the, the, you know, within the general exclusion zone. And then a bit about information, uh, inspection, maintenance and thorough examination. And of course, information such as training and competence. So, okay, um, really great to, uh, to see you all at the webinar today. Um, we've got um, a couple of questions. Um, and if I just um, I'll try and go through this. In fact, I've got quite a lot, lot of one saying can't see your screen, but I've got that now. Um, thank you, Craig. Um, so are some rescue systems single use? Um, right, so what you're possibly saying there is that the way the standard was written, the EN280 standard, that every time that you, you um, interface with the machine to lower that machine, um, essentially what you had to do was um, potentially cut a tie, tie, uh, like a tie wrap on a, on the emergency lowering, um, and then for that machine then to be um, um, fit to be used again, it had to be reset. That's I, I think that's what you're trying to say there, Jamie. And essentially, you are you you, you are right um, in some respects, but there is something that's that's come in change. What they've realised, I think, is they've made a mistake by essentially counting this um, this elusive, you know, how many times an emergency lowering system has been used. Um, so essentially, I could take a certain type of machine, 
if I go to emergency lower rate, what the manufacturer wanted to know, but because of the uh, the directive, was how many times that system has been activated, so they can build a picture on you know if that machine is is, is being used. Uh, for a rescue um, and what some some manufacturers have put like a clock behind or a counting system that counts every time a, a, a um, emergency lowering system has been used um, whereas some have actually approached it in a different way um, re rescue systems uh, there won't be single use but some may have to be um, reset can an operate, operator trained on a 3a use a pav or a 1a or do they need the separate IPATH competency. Um, thanks, Craig. The answer to that one, if they have been trained on a 3A, which is a mobile vertical machine, provided they have had familiarization, um, they are able to use a PAV. Of course, some companies will not accept that and they will say that the um, you know the company, uh, the, 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 the individuals must be PAV trained. The PAV is a course in itself. Um, that's a half day course, um, which you, 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 know, you can top up your, your card. Um, let me have a quick look. One other question. Do delivery drivers have to wear a harness? Um, the, the standard issue, uh, the, the, the standard um, um, guidance in the industry is that drivers should wear a harness when loading a boom type, um, uh, loading and unloading a boom type uh, machine. You know, so if they're loading a boom a boom type machine on and off a transporter, we would expect that they wear a harness. From our perspective, it's company policy that they must wear a harness. If they are loading or unloading a vertical type machine, they do not need to do that. Um, some of our site managers have been told by other companies that they do not need to wear them. Well, uh, so that was the second part of your question. Um, I would I would say that um, you know they need to check their facts because you know the guidance is uh, the guidance is out there. Um, should you fail to to meet that guidance, then you know the, the, something happens. You may get uh, you know you know certainly a prosecution against you. Uh, Somebody said, very good presentation. I also run, uh, already run practice exercises without our operators on site and the introduction of toolbox talk to all personnel on site in case they have an emergency on site. Fantastic. That's great. That uh, For someone to lower the machine at ground level, what competency does he need? I.e., does he have to be mute operator or can he be trained by the operator to lower it? So the guidance, the ideal, the best way in the world would be that that person is a trained operator. The reality is you're not going to go and train a, um, you know, a yardman, you're not going to go and train. Um, and I'm mindful that I'm, this this webinar is available to all industries. You know, somebody working in a, in a shopping centre to, to do that. The, the idea would be that, that there is yes. The 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 least that you must do is is familiarise them how to how to use it, and that can be done by the operator showing them how to bring that machine back down. Um, I've got one question there. Um, come from Paul. How long does the mutual manager's course last, and how long is the license valid for? So it's valid. It, the course lasts for one day. It's for ten people, uh, and it and the, the license um, or the certificate, if you call it, is up to uh, five years. Um, and I've got another question there. Somebody said, "What do you mean by standoff distance?" All right, okay. Just to clarify. The standoff dif distance is established to ensure that the there is no part of the MUP that cannot accidentally enter that exclusion zone. So whether that's the so whether that's um, you know seven six you know three one meters whatever that is. So that standoff distance includes the full extension of the boom even at full reach. So no part can reach inside the exclusion zone. Now it's good practice as well also to stand the MUP chassis with the line of the travel which is perpendicular to the power lines at the time. So you would have the machine in line to the power lines and at the end of the day, then hopefully all being well, there is no way that that, um, that you know, that can, um, you know, you know go into the, the um, you know, the exclusion zone. And I've got last question there is, um, we see secondary guarding uh, predominantly on boom type machines. When will they be available for scissor lifts? Um, I can tell you that manufacturers are working on the concept um of secondary guarding for scissors um and but one thing i will remind you of is that you know we, we see these shrouds put over controls you know and they are not what we consider to be secondary guarding okay so just make sure that you're aware of that because some people do still think that they are um you know they are secondary guarding okay my details are there anybody who wishes to get in touch feel free um drop me a note whatever you, you know um good bad or indifferent um but really big thank you for um 
joining us today on this webinar. Um, as I say, my name is Brian Parker. Apologies for that uh, technical area, uh, error at the earlier. Um, I'll have to look at that little button that says show your full screen next time. But thank you very much. Stay safe. Hope you, uh, hope, uh, you get home well with the snow today. So thank you very much. Cheers. Bye.